Hello, and welcome to the North Coast Journal Preview, where we take a look at the stories in the current edition of the North Coast Journal. I'm your host, Dave Frank, and I'm joined this week by Thad Greenson, news editor, and Jennifer Famico Cahill, arts and features editor. Welcome, guys. How you doing? Dave, how you doing? Doing great, thanks. Um, sunny, sunshine day, uh, kind of uh, de- deceptively nice out, even though it's cold. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, it looks like uh, we're going to have to dive into more COVID bleak news. It kind of was more fitting when it was gray and gray and cold. But uh, Thad, why don't you uh, tell us what's on the cover of this week's North Coast Journal? Yeah, I am. Um, I am sorry to break it to you, Dave, but I think we're going to be in bleak COVID mode for a while, regardless yeah. of the weather. Um, <clears throat> but this week's uh, cover story, we dive into the Humboldt Del Norte uh, Sports League, the high school sports league up here. Um, their decision last week to, um, to suspend all spectators from uh, from their sporting events for at least the next couple of weeks until January 23rd, at which point they'll uh, they'll reevaluate. <clears throat> so this is pretty. I'm, I'm guessing controversial within the community. So I guess uh, you could tell us a little bit about kind of like how that decision came to be made and then I guess what the some of the pushback, anticipated pushback might be. Yeah, like like everything COVID and education related these days, highly controversial. Um, but um, and it, I, it's also I think worth noting this is one of the the few uh, examples we have of, uh, of an organization being really proactive and doing something um, you know beyond what uh, what health officers guidelines uh, have ordered. But so yeah, so I think as everybody knows, on January third we got kind of this bombshell report from public health that was kind of two pronged. One was that uh, a confirmation that Omicron is is circulating locally. Um, it had been for a couple of weeks, and then also the confirmation of a then record 400 new uh, new cases of the virus locally, and that really set off just kind of um, you know the, these escalating case counts and um, and the the surge that we're now in the midst of, and so. Even prior to that report, um, superintendents of local schools had been really nervous about the return to in-person instruction on January 3rd, coming back from the winter break, um, recognizing that uh, families likely did a lot of traveling and gathering over the break, um, were more likely to, to have exposure, and then also just seeing this Omicron wave kind of hitting the entire country and case counts um, escalating really rapidly. And so um, some of them had actually warned parents that, you know, things were going to be a little bit rocky, had already heard from uh, from teachers and staff that they were testing positive in the lead up to that January 3rd uh, return to instruction. And then uh, districts also distributed like rapid um, home tests to families. And so some superintendents said that they'd started to hear prior to the return of students on January 3rd that families were testing positive and kind of sensed this looming spike coming. Um, then the January 3rd report came from public health, and according to superintendents and the HDNL uh, commissioner, Jack Lakin, there was kind of this instant wave of concern over administrators of kind of what are we going to do, how are we going to manage to keep schools open throughout the course of this surge that seems just imminent, or seemed just imminent at that point, and now we're obviously in the midst of. And so... <clears throat> You know, different districts started doing different things, um, and many of them started sus- considering suspending extracurricular activities. And uh, of course, sports is involved in that. And so, some were looking for um, some started suggested canceling the, um, two weeks worth of games and kind of pausing the season. Um, Jack Lake and the commissioner said, you know, there's no way with the kind of all of the confines of a sports season um, that those games would end up being rescheduled. And you know, he and other superintendents being mindful that um, that student athletes had missed the entirety of the 2020 spring season and then had a really truncated 2021 season, really wanted to put a premium on um, letting the games proceed. And so they just started talking about kind of a safe way to do that. And then um, Jack um, made the recommendation to the league that they they take the step to ban uh, spectators. And um, kind of usually it's the school athletic directors or the district athletic directors that vote on league matters. And he he brought this to superintendents saying that it needed to be kind of a top level decision and asked them for an immediate vote. And uh, the vote was six to four in favor of banning sp- uh, spectators for two weeks, oh, wow. um, at which point they'll reevaluate, you know, as we get up to the 23rd to see um, how to proceed with the rest of the season. So six to four, can, I can't even imagine what would happen if it was five to five, but, uh, you know, this is how it went. So at least there's yeah. a little bit of a reprieve now for a couple of weeks. And mm-hmm. then I kind of I kind of front loaded the question. But um, so this is how they came to the decision, supervisors. Uh, superintendents rather mm. were projecting out that best case for pro- to be proactive to prevent spread, keep schools open. But like I said, there's 
probably uh, you're going to tell us about some pushback and some resistance to that decision. Yeah, the, I mean, the pushback and, and the kind of outcry and response was was instant. And, um, you know, it's I think as anybody who's been around um, high school sports knows that parents are, are heavily invested in, in these games. And um, and, you know, I think it's important to recognize while students have lost out on so much over the last two years as far as um, as high school athletics, um, lots of parents feel the same that they haven't had the, those ex- had those shared experiences with their kids. And so there was a lot of anger directed at, at HDNL. And, um, you know, and as I noted before, this wasn't something that was thrust upon them by the state or by some other a- entity. This was a proactive decision that they made. And so, um, you know, there was nobody for them to kind of turn and point to as having made the decision for them. Um, and so, yeah, parents, um, there was an immediately kind of a petition that started circulating, um, calling on them to reverse the decision, which uh, as of today has uh, more than 2,100 signatures um, and, you know, some very, um, very upset comments. Um, and uh, Super First District Supervisor Rex Bone uh, put uh, the announcement on his Facebook page and that drew some 400 comments, almost all of them from, from very upset parents. Um, not to, not to belabor this because there's not much we can do now. I mean, the, the votes in place and anticipating a, a couple of weeks. Um, but just to sort of, I guess, some validity to to the decision or verification. You also in the in the story you include some photos of sporting events and and Jen, Jen pointed this out too uh, before we actually talked today. But uh, it indicates you know I don't know. I'll let you describe what what these photos indicate for validation purposes. Well. Um... I mean, they they definitely portray um, stands with uh, with very few masks and almost no social distancing. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that popped up on some comment boards um, in response to the decision is, well, why don't we just have you know everybody mask and distance? And if masks work and distancing works, why is this necessary? Well, it's necessary, you know, a because every incremental step reduces spread, but also b because left to their own devices. You know, parents and, and fellow students have not been masking and distancing at these events, um, which cr- really turns them into super spreader events, potentially. And, um, and there are lots of people in that crowd, too, who are pulling down their masks so that they can yell. Right. Which is the thing, you know, projecting your voice, singing, shouting. Those are the things that are, you know, really key in super spreaders, mm-hmm. as, as that is written about before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'll note, you know, too, that a couple of superintendents I spoke to um, said that they really didn't want to put school staff in, in on the front lines of having to enforce, you know, these these um, protocols um, with the kind of highly charged political environment that we're in um, and just felt like that was asking too much of them and, and putting them at risk of, of other altercations and stuff like that. Well, thank you very much for covering this. I think it's really important for people to get the, the complete picture, especially now, like in the heat of this what appears to be a, a spike and surge, mm-hmm. um, which is a great segue to, you know, our uh, public health officer's recent meeting and announcement. Want to tell us a little bit about that uh, that story from this week's issue also? Yeah. So um, yesterday on Tuesday, we kind of got the, I think most of us were blindsided by the announcement that uh, the uh, public health officer, Ian Hoffman, is stepping down, um, is moving on to a different position, unspecified position that he's accepted um, that will return him to clinical practice. Um, and he, um, in a letter to the Board of Supervisors announcing the decision, um, he said that he would stay on till into, into March. Um, so he's giving some time for a transition and stuff like that. Um, but he really pointed the, the reason for the decision as his family and just that the the demands of the job um, of health officer don't allow him kind of the, the work life balance that he needs and, and that his family needs right now. And so he really felt like this was the right move um, on that front. Um, of course, you know, as we've been talking about it, it comes at a time when Humboldt County is really facing an, an unprecedented level of virus spread locally. Um, and uh, and, you know, for for the surges we've had previously as far as uh, as the first holiday surge and then and then Delta in July, August and September, um, the numbers that we're seeing, um, you know, over the last week and a half are just um, just dwarf those. They're, they're just um, they would have been unimaginable a handful of months ago. And so the caseload, that's the top line number that everybody, you know, that's the shocking number. But under the surface is really what's impacting, you know, that there's the consequences of that. Mm-hmm. So bes- besides um, hospitalization uh, and death, uh, um, which are the unfortunate 
you know implications of what happens when this spreads there's also the 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 quarantining and the and the you know the the sort of economic impacts and can you tell us a little bit about about that sort of the the imp, the quarantine impact on the health system yeah so what we've seen you know play out in in other parts of the country with this omicron surge is that um you know, hospitals are being overwhelmed on, on a number of fronts, but it's, um, and I'll get back to that in a moment, but it's not just hospitals. It's that um, because this, this, this strain of the virus is spreading so quickly um, and so widely that we're seeing just all kinds of sectors impacted um, from, you know, I am sure most people coming out of the holidays um, saw news of all kinds of airline flight cancellations, um, you know, and that was not because of fears of risk of spread. That was because they didn't have the crews to, to work those flights um, just because too many employees had fallen ill and were calling in sick. And that's the same thing we've seen with school districts um, across the country and are starting to see locally is, um, is staff shortages as, as, as a role, result of infections. And so I think it's noted in the, in the story, but two local schools have, ha have had to kind of pivot back to online learning temporarily. And that was, you know, not pro not a proactive move to avoid spread in the schools or anything like that. Though That's because too many staff members called in sick to allow them to safely, um, you know, have, have in-person school. Um, they would have had to consolidate classes and it would have just been kind of a recipe for, for further spread. And, and um, there's this... Sorry, go ahead. If there was more you were going to add. Oh, and then I was just going to come back to the to the hospital side of it. Um, yeah. And you know, we we have seen this. A lot has been made of this the, this strain of the virus being milder and resulting in less severe infections, which um, certainly at this point anyway appears to be true um, overall. But um, because the overall caseloads are so high, there's still a lot of people going to the hospital with COVID, and. This this surge is impacting hospitals um, in different ways than previous ones for for kind of a variety of reasons. Um, similar to to other surges, you have people critically ill with COVID who need hospitalization. Um, so that hasn't changed. But what has changed is this this strain is so virulent and is so able to infect um, fully vaccinated individuals is that it's hitting hospital staff and infecting hospital staff at a far greater rate than prior prior iterations have. Um, so you have a lot of um, hospital staffers testing positive and having to quarantine and not being able to fill those positions. And, you know, which is very true in Humboldt, as it's true in a lot of other places in the country that, you know, our, um, the carrying capacity of our health system comes down to trained employees, trained professionals to, to staff beds. I think on the early side of this pandemic, there was all this focus on how many hospital beds, how many ICU beds places had. And what we're really realizing is it's not the physical structures, it's not the equipment, it's staff that is the limiting factor. Um, so that's the second way that, that this has really hit hospitals hard. And the third is that um, because the virus is so widespread, we're having more and more patients come to a come to the hospital, not for COVID care, not because they're suffering, you know, of COVID symptoms, but because they need other types of care. They're having, heart, you know, congestive heart failure or all of these other things that we go to the hospital for. And when they get there, they don't even know they have COVID, but they test positive for COVID, which triggers all these protocols that the hospitals need to have in place to prevent spread of the virus through the hospital and through the hospital's employees um, that are very labor intensive. And so... This, you know, this surge, while again, you know, um, shown to cause less severe illness overall, is kind of this perfect storm of factors that is really overwhelming hospital systems, um, which we've seen elsewhere. Um, we're not there locally yet, but our case numbers um, indicate that we will, you know, soon. Um, it's important for everybody to remember that uh, hospitalizations generally trail infections by, you know, seven seven days to two weeks, and so you know, we're 10 days out of, of kind of the start of the surge right now. And so we should expect to see hospitalizations really start to pick up locally um, soon. And in the coming weeks, we'll continue to track this. And, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about it again next week. And so thank you very much for keeping us in the loop on this. It's it's unfortunate to hear uh, about Dr. Hoffman. But, uh, you know, we, we felt the same thing when Dr. Frankovich uh, decided to, you know, family like work, work balance was was an important factor in making the decision to step down. So mm -hmm. uh, we'll, we'll follow that story as well. So thanks again, Thad. Absolutely, Dave. How about you, Jen? What is going on this week on the Arts and Features Beat? This week, it's not COVID. <laughs> however, <laughs> however, I know as, as we're listening to all this and we're thinking, oh boy, what is, this, what is this wave going to bring us? And, you know, while I haven't heard much about lockdown exactly, certainly mixing households and gathering seems like a bad idea right now. 
And it might be time to revisit baking. I, <laughs> if you threw out your sourdough starter, if you decided, oh, forget this, no more of my own cooking, I've had it. I get it. In June, I invested heavily in lipstick, but here we are, still <laughs> masked. So in case you feel like now is the time for me to perfect the chocolate chip cookie, the chocolate chip cookie of your own dreams, I should say. Draw inspiration from this week. Simona Carini, she of all vegetables. Mm -hmm. She, the queen of produce, also has a dark side, a dark chocolatey side. <laughs> and she recently dove into the science tinkering, the engineering of the cookie of her dreams. Um, for Simona, and I mean, her exactitude is amazing. We were looking, we were all doing the recipe, like editing and proofreading the, the recipe in the building and just sort of going, oh my God, is she serious? There are four <laughs> kinds of flour in this oh, bad wow. boy. A small <laughs> amount of tahini, chocolate that is cut into both chunks and slivers. Because you know how when you, okay, it's not crazy though. Because I remember years ago when I questioned come on, she had a recipe that involved slicing an orange three sixteenths of an inch. And I was like, come on. But then I made it at home and I was like, yeah, quarter inch is too big. Eighth of an inch is too small, three sixteenths <laughs> of an inch. Um, but she's right. She's not, that's the thing that she's not wrong, like ever. <laughs> the thing about having a chocolate chunk cookie, so nice, big hunks of chocolate. But when you have a very dark chocolate, it doesn't melt in the same way without all that butterfat in it. And when you have slivers of chocolate mixed with chunks of chocolate, it's just better. <laughs> you get a little bit, you never get a cookie that's just like, you're, I don't know if any of you, no, you're too good. You're good people, you would never do this. But there are those of us who turn over a cookie to see if it is devoid of chocolate chips. You know, <laughs> sometimes you get that last cookie from the batch and it's just like empty and you're like, there's like a half a walnut in there. But <laughs> this allows every cookie bite to be chocolatey. So you are never ripped off. You are never the person who pulls a bare nacho out of the platter. So, <laughs> <laughs> so she's not wrong. And she puts like, it sounds crazy, but a little bit of rye flour, a little bit of, um, as I said, tahini is in it. And then you start to think about it, the sort of creamy sesame and the rye flour has that little tartness to it. And you start thinking about all the times you've had chocolate pairings, you know, chocolate pairings with wines or whiskeys and what have you. It's not crazy to have a different flavored cookie. It doesn't always have to be the Toll House cookie. But what I what I really loved about it was her dedication. I don't know how many cookies this woman made, right. um, <laughs> but she really tinkered until she found the one she loved. And I find that inspiring. And I would imagine that anybody who goes into this recipe is going to make it a few times until they tinker and make it the way they want it. Um, and I think that's a beautiful pursuit, especially when you can't go out. Right. Um, <laughs> and she recommends making extra and sharing it with people. And, you know, she's not wrong. This is one of the few ways we have to be good to each other, right? Yeah. To, in a way, it's, it's a kind of a gathering, right? We break bread virtually. Um, while we have to be probably apart from each other, you know, not mixing households again for a while, um, you know, making a beautiful batch of cookies and sharing it with people, it's kind of lovely. It's old fashioned. And if you want to go hard, it's got four flowers in it. <laughs> So, so one of my neighbors actually baked cookies for us for the holidays, and I have to say it definitely uh, was a warm spot in, in all of our hearts here in the household um, about that gift. It was chocolate chip cookies, and yeah, that's mm -hmm. you can't go wrong. Nobody's mad at cookies showing up. And then, you know, also fantastically on brand, much like uh, Simona, this week we also have a story from Mike Kelly, and it is about elephant seals. And... Um, <laughs> It began, if you haven't been reading the washed up column, I don't know what's wrong with you. Maybe you're squeamish, but he writes about things that wash up on our beaches. And we have all been on a beach in Humboldt and gone, what in the Sam hell is that? And it 
whether it's a blob or a whole fish or part of something, and you're like, I can't even tell if that's plant or animal. Mike Kelly has probably seen it and has probably written about it. And um, boy, when I think back to when we started this column a few years ago, um, sitting with him in Ramones and trying to convince him that this would be a great column. And he was like, I don't know. He's like, I don't write normal marine biology explainers for kids. It's going to be weird. And I was like, <laughs> how weird could it be? Yeah. For it. Well, this one. <laughs> this one involves, we learn about elephant seals um, when our narrator explains all the ways in which he has had his body modified to be like an elephant seal, including its crazy proboscis and the barking noises he makes. Um, and apparently it's, it's going to help him meet females of one sort or another um because elephant seals have a full harem going um the barking and flopping doesn't work so well in a disco setting but um you know still we learn a lot of very wild stuff about uh elephant seals including that the females give birth to a 70 pound baby <laughs> I was very happily informed um, with some follow-up questions that it's never twins. <laughs> <laughs> and at least it's one. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and that after just a couple of months or a few, was it three months of, of nursing, they're like 300 pounds. Yeah. They grow up so fast. Um, Who knew milk was anyway, so rich? Yeah, right? I mean, please, just wait. I, I'm I'm gonna blame myself if elephant seal milk is the next, you know, protein shake muscle builder <laughs> for those six games that you need to make. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a fun story and it is prime Mike Kelly. Um, the photo that's in the paper is of a little elephant seal um, on the Mad River Beach. There's not uh, there's not too many of the of the elephant seals that end up washed up around here. Um, those photos are online for those of you who are a little sturdier of constitution. Um, but the one that's, the one that's in the paper is very adorable and just sort of, it's a young one. It's very cute. And, uh, yeah, so there's all kinds of places where you can see, um, seals and, and you should look through the slideshow to see, uh, where to go on your elephant seal trek next. Really worth reading because it's hysterical. It really is. And so informative. So, I, you know, props for Mike out there. This was really great. Yeah, you kind of get to the end of them and you're like, I don't know what happened to me, but I know more now. Yeah. And yeah. he's a biologist. So it's it works. It totally yeah. works. That's right. I also have a, a, a blast from our office's past. Uh, Cassie Curatolo, who used to work on staff at the Journal, is now back in town and freelancing for us. And she has written a review of a dramatic podcast, Dark Woods. It is not true crime. Take a break from <laughs> true crime. Listen to some stuff about fake crime. Um, I am ex extremely happy to see the trend of fiction via podcast. Um, I am a person who loves radio drama. And I remember in the, the early days of, you know, my involvement in the internet, finding a place where I could stream radio dramas was like, oh, I loved it so much. But this is a radio drama that is set in Humboldt and get out your Humboldt uh, fiction bingo cards because <clears throat> it does have a cartel. It does have the seedy underbelly of the cannabis business, et cetera, et cetera. And there's some eye rolly stuff, but Cassie seems to think that it's a fun listen and it's, uh, got really good pacing, and it's from the people who did Law and Order. Dun dun. Okay. So it's very, you know, it's very profesh. It's very slick in its way, and it is heading for a TV adaptation. So you might as well get in on the ground floor so you can talk about how you listened to it before it was cool. That's pretty cool. Hopefully, they actually like do some camera work up here because the spoiler, you know, Fern Canyon plays a geographic role in the story. Very true. Well, awesome. Jen, there was so much there this week. This is really cool. Thanks for keeping us in the loop on the arts and features world. Thanks for having us. That's about all the time we have this week. Dad and Jennifer, thank you again both so much. North Coast Journal is available on newsstands now. Pick one up. Stay informed. Also available anytime 24-7 online. 
um, until next week, everybody, um, you know, take care. We'll see you again soon. Bye. See you next week. <laughs>